Last time we talked about the politics of the Gilded Age. Essentially, you had the Republican Party during the Gilded Age was all about helping big business. They'd moved away from their reform roots during the Civil War, after the Civil War. As time goes by, they start to view the main purpose of the Republican Party to get involved in the economy and help out business. The thought was, if you help American business grow, particularly American big business, these businesses will outcompete uh, British businesses, French businesses, and this will be good for the American people as a whole. Democratic Party was small government. Generally, the smaller the government, the better. And Democrats didn't want to help business. They didn't want to regulate business either. They basically thought, hands off, the government's place is not in the economy. Well, this sort of political environment is going to mean that politicians aren't going to be the power players in the Gilded Age. Instead, what we're going to see is a handful of people you'll sometimes hear referred to as robber barons are going to become the true powers in the United States. This handful of wealthy individuals. Now, who you define as a robber baron, this can vary. Some people say there's only a dozen or so robber barons. Some people put it in the couple thousands of robber barons. However you want to define robber baron, just know that essentially most of the wealth in the United States is going to go to a handful of people. The reason we're going to call these guys robber barons is because it sort of harkens back to the medieval period. So this is a, a cartoon from the time comparing Gilded Age robber barons to these medieval robber barons. So back in medieval times, robber barons were these people of wealth who didn't really contribute, didn't work, and the only reason they were wealthy was because they owned property or they had wealth. They weren't working, they weren't innovating, they weren't entrepreneurs. They made money because they had money. So, for example, somebody that was born into wealth, let's farmers work their land, and then they get a percentage of the crops they make, or maybe they own a bridge. They don't do anything with the bridge. They just sit there, collect a toll when people cross it, and basically they just collect money for owning things, not collecting money for doing things. Well, this is going to be the impression that a lot of people are going to get from these robber barons. Basically, they're going to be wealthy people who make money and get people to pay into them, not because they're innovators, not because necessarily they do things better than other people, but because they were first to an industry or because they uh, have the money. So what we're going to see with these robber barons is essentially people get into a position where they're going to be able to manipulate the capitalist system like it had never been manipulated before. So before the Civil War, you're going to have the development of industry. Actually, even before that, let's go back to when the United States was first formed. America comes out, you know, 1776, Declaration of Independence. If you went around, you'll look, most Americans, a vast majority, are making their own stuff. So they're growing their own food. They're, you know, making their own furniture. They're sewing their own clothes, uh, you know, raising their own cows for meat, that type of thing. They're subsistence, all right? Now, there are going to be a handful of the people that work in industry, but the vast majority of people produce what they're consuming. Now, this starts to change in the early 1800s. We start, sort of start getting in this market economy. American farmers, instead of growing, you know, apples over here, wheat over here, corn over here, you know, cows over there, instead what they'll start doing is focusing on a specific crop, growing that crop well because it's all you're specializing in, and then taking the surplus, selling it at the market, then using these goods to take care of your needs, you know, to buy your clothing, buy your furniture, uh, buy your other food. Or you maybe go to work in a factory for an individual business owner. So maybe somebody owns a factory, let's say making shoes. Um, this person makes shoes, let's say in Boston. Maybe they produce the best shoes in Boston. Um, <clears throat> and but they're going to be sold throughout Boston. They're going to know all their employees. And you're going to work for a wage. Uh, you know your employer. You go home. You're going to use your wage to buy clothing, pay rent, that type of thing. So you knew your employer. And you're going to see these businesses sort of have a cap to how big they can get before the Civil War. Let's say you're the best shoe producer in Boston, all right? Let's say you can produce shoes actually better than anywhere else in the United States. If your shoes could be sold magically with some transporter in um, down all the way in Charleston, South Carolina, 
people are going to buy them because they can buy them cheaper than any shoes there. They're better quality than the shoes down in, in uh, Charleston. So why wouldn't I buy this Boston shoe if it was down there? Well, the thing is, before the Civil War, you can't just magically ship a shoe from Boston down to Charleston because it's going to take a lot of time. Now, uh, you know, the transportation costs are going to add to this cost. So a $20 shoe in Boston, by the time you put it on carts and, you know, boats and uh, take it through canals, maybe a couple railroads by that point, by the time it gets down to Charleston, that's a lot of added cost to pay for the transportation, the people that transported it. So maybe the chief is going to sell us for $40. It's impossible to get anything other than uh, a, re you know, regional market share. But what begins to happen after the Civil War is we start seeing these railroads. They've been spreading out before the Civil War, but they're going to start spreading out even more after the Civil War. And this is going to connect the United States like it had never been connected before. And what this is going to mean is this hypothetical shoe manufacturer in Boston, it, he can now get his shoes down to Charleston, South Carolina, and now they can sell cheaper for than uh, they can produce in Charleston, and maybe people will start buying them, and you start seeing an economy that's not regional any longer. Technology, innovation, railroads are going to start connecting the economy of the United States, and we'll see a handful of individuals, these robber barons, take advantage of these new loopholes, these new technologies, to gain a market share to where they drive others out of competition and basically they control all of certain industries throughout the United States. Uh, you kind of see this right here. This would be, uh, and then they once they get to this market share, they can do whatever they want to consumers, charge whatever they want. They can treat workers however they want. And you're going to kind of see this image right here. So this is robber barons. And you basically have the people of the United States kneeling to them as if they're kings. This guy would be an entrepreneur, a businessman. He's sitting here paying these guys uh, his money. you got this guy, industrial worker. You always see these hats um, for industrial worker. He's sitting here giving these guys his wages. And you see here this farmer uh, giving interest on his mortgage farm. This is sort of the impression you get is that because these guys come up with a way to manipulate the system, they're going to be everybody's going to owe them, all right? Not because they're necessarily producing better things, but because they manipulated things better than the next guy. Now, how are these guys able to do this? Well, what they're going to do is they're going to start taking advantage of something, or they're going to start creating something called a monopoly, all right? We've all played the board game. This comes from this idea that's going to happen during the Gilded Age. We, we have monopolies before this, but we're going to see these monopolies basically spread across the United States. And in some cases, really, you'll have monopolies across the world. So what is a monopoly? It's basically driving out of business competitors in an industry to the point where you control almost all of a specific thing. You know, maybe be it shirts or be it shoes or be it copper or be it oil. And if anybody wants to get this product, they've got to go through you, okay? And again, you can have local monopolies, you can have broader monopolies, but it's you're the only game in town. Now, there are a couple different types of monopolies. Um, one of the biggest type is a geographical monopoly. Basically, you can control all of the resources in just a specific area to where somebody uh, the only, somebody needs something, they got to go to you. Now, during the Gilded Age, we've had this before, but during the Gilded Age, one of the new types of geographical monopolies we're going to see are going to be railroads. A lot of farmers will spread out, and we're going to talk about this more later, to acquire new land, particularly in the West. They're going to, before, you know, before the development of the railroad, if you wanted to buy land, you're probably going to have to go up along a river to get this land because that's the only way to get your goods to market. But as railroads start to spread out, you don't need to be by a river to get your crops to market because when you produce something, you take it to the railroads, you ship it to market. So you'll start to see farmers spreading out along railroads, building their homesteads, improving their homesteads, tilling the land, uh, putting down roots, you know, building a farmhouse, bringing their crops to market. Everything's fine for the first couple of years. But railroads start to realize, hey, I can charge this guy whatever I want to bring his crops to market. He has no other option. There's not another river around to bring his crops to market. There's no automobile yet. 
So I'll charge this guy what I want. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more later. This is going to be a huge problem for farmers because railroads are essentially going to uh, take most of their profits. So you can have geographical monopolies. The ones we're going to see and the ones we're going to talk about for the Gilded Age, though, in particular these big businesses, are vertical and horizontal integration, okay? Sometimes you can have uh, vertical integration. I, I don't necessarily want you to worry about this one as much. You can ask your economics professor or something about it. But what vertical integration is, is when somebody will buy every step in a production process. Let's say you want to make a shirt. Um, and you want to make this shirt cheaper than anybody else. Well, what you can do is you can buy the cotton farms that produce it. You can then buy the railroads that ship it to the factory. You can then buy the factory. You can buy the dye that you use for the wool. You can buy the machines to, uh, that you uh, produce the cloth. And then maybe you can even buy the store that sells the cloth. And because you do this, you're not dealing with any middlemen in between. They're going to be taking a cut of the profit. So when your shirt gets to the market, it's going to sell cheaper than this guy who has to deal with the cotton farmer, has to deal with the railroads to ship it, and then you know finally they get to their factory and produce it. But they have to take into account this consideration. That's vertical uh, integration. Don't worry about that one just yet. The one I want you to worry about, and we're going to talk about in depth, and the one that's going to be big during this Gilded Age is horizontal integration where you're going to see certain guys take over specific industries and this is going to be certain things that are needed in multiple industries so you need steel for a lot of different things a lot of different things require steel a lot of different things require oil you're going to have the, a lot of things require copper you're going to have some guys come in and basically put out of business people that in these businesses and they're going to sort of occupy this rung to where um, if you want to do business in the United States or you want to do business, you're going to have to deal with them. So I want to talk about one specific individual that's going to sort of embody the uh, robber barons and it's going to sort of epitomize this Gilded Age uh, economics. And this is a guy, John D. Rockefeller. You can think of him as the best of the robber barons, the worst of the robber barons, however you want to put it. But he's going to be a guy that's going to take this monopoly and sort of perfect it. And he's going to, uh, well, he's going to serve as a perfect example of, uh, of somebody who, who creates a, a, a national monopoly. So what Johnny Rockefeller, his background isn't that unique. He was uh, second to six children born to lower middle class family uh, father you know the salesman his mother stayed at home uh, at young age or a, a teenager he's gonna get a job as a bookkeeper uh, for a shipping company so basically a company that you know uses railroads or uses ships to, sh to ship products to market if you need to deliver your goods uh, you take to the shipping company and they'll you pay them a price they'll get them to markets throughout the US so he starts doing this at a young age. This is before the Civil War. Well, Johnny Rockefeller is going to prove to be very good with numbers. He's going to start coming up with ways to ship products much cheaper than they'd shipped before. So he's going to say, instead of paying this rail company to go here, this rail company to go here, why don't we pack as many products of this in here? We get off at this tra train station, we ship over here. This will allow us to ship cheaper get things to market much quicker and then we can maximize profits I'm giving it a, a probably not doing a good job of explaining it just know he knows how to do things more efficiently than just about anybody uh, cutting costs he's very good at, at that well this is gonna allow him to rise in the ranks of his shipping company and he's gonna start making money so much money in fact that when the Civil War comes along they hold this draft and um, he's not he, uh, in Ohio, he's he's going to uh, uh, end up, you know, you're supposed to do military service, but like Grover Cleveland, he's going to have enough money to hire a replacement to work for him. So while somebody else is off fighting the war uh, for John D. Rockefeller, he's going to continue to profit as, as a shipper. Well, during the Civil War, John D. Rockefeller is going to see that there's this new burgeoning industry in the United States that he thinks he can take advantage of and he thinks he can make a lot of money uh, doing and this is oil refining so oil has become 
extremely important during the middle of the uh, 19th century. Um, before this point, people needed oil, but not as much as they're going to need in the mid-1800s. Before this, as a matter of fact, people got most of their oil from whales. You would go out, kill a whale, take the blubber, melt it down, and what people would generally use this for is like kerosene for lamps. You know, that's that's the only thing they use oil for. But in the mid-1800s, you're going to ha see an increase in machinery. So steam-operated machinery. Uh, you're going to see uh, railroads. You need grease to get railroad uh, trestles to move. Um, you don't need petroleum as much. There's not many things that run on petroleum at this point. But you do need grease and oil uh, to operate machinery. And John D. Rockefeller is going to notice whales, they don't cut it. You're not going to, they're not going to produce enough fat. By this point, the whales are becoming more and more scarce. Um, so there needs to be another way to get oil. Well, some people had started to extract this black gunk out of the ground and create grease and oil out of that. There's a problem with this. If you take this black gunk out of the ground, it's not going to come out. You can't just slap it into a machine because there's rocks and dirt and junk in it. Well, Johnny Rockefeller is going to realize there's a market in refining this oil and t turning it into a finished product. So he's going to start in getting into refining where if he will take oil that you extract from the ground, you bring it to him, and basically he'll filter it out and turn it into a finished product, something you can put in a machine. Well, he starts doing this in Ohio, and because he's such an efficient businessman, he's going to be able to sell his oil for much cheaper than his competitors, and he's going to start doing well uh, locally in Ohio. Um, he's going to start this standard oil business, standard oil of Ohio, and he's going to uh, start doing better than his competitors. Well, John D. Rockefeller at that point, making a lot of money, he's going to be making more than most of his neighboring competitors, and so... Uh, and he's going to be selling his oil cheaper, and he's going to have a better product just because of his business acumen. Well, at this point, John D. Rockefeller is going to start doing things to build up a monopoly. So what he'll do is he's going to start going to his competitors, and he's able to uh, get to his competitors in ways that you couldn't before the Civil War because uh, railroads are now around. They're spreading everywhere. But he'll go to maybe his neighboring competitor, and he'll say to this guy, hey, it looks like I'm starting to get an advantage on you. I think I'm eventually, you know, you're not going to be able to compete with me. So why don't you sell me your business? I'll take care over your refineries. We'll put the Rockefeller name on them. Uh, I'll get your market share. You'll make a little bit of cash. I buy you out. Some of his competitors will do that. Some of them will say, fine, um, you, know, I, you know, I'm not going to be able to compete with you. And then John D. Rockefeller grows his business from there. Other competitors don't want to sell. And some of these guys are going to be able to sell their products, especially on the local market, for cheaper than John D. Rockefeller because by the time he gets to their market, you had transportation costs. They're not, uh, you know, things are going to be uh, more expensive. Well, John D. Rockefeller is more expendable capital than these guys, so he's going to go to some of these uh, local but, you know, a little bit distant from him uh, competitors, and he's going to say to these guys, can I buy you out? No, I'm happy running my business locally here. I think I can sell my my oil cheaper here locally than than you can. Um, you know, I think you know I, I'll make. Uh, you're you're not going to be able to uh, compete with me locally. Well, Johnny Rockefeller at this point he has more expendable capital than these guys. If they won't sell to him, what he's going to do is he's going to take that expendable capital and he's going to get intentionally get a loss. So what he'll do is let's say it takes this guy $10 or $9 to produce a barrel of oil, uh, refined oil, sells it at the market for $10. John D. Rockefeller, it takes him $10 to produce this barrel of oil and ship it to this guy's market. So he is going to be having to sell it for $11. Well, John D. Rockefeller has expendable capital, so what he'll start to do is go to this guy's market I'm going to take a loss for a little while. I'm going to now sell my barrels of oil in this guy's market for a dollar. Sure, I'm losing money for a while, but people are going to start buying my oil because, darn, it's so cheap. Well, that's going to be the reality for the next year. He sells at this loss. This guy, he doesn't have the capital John D. Rockefeller does. He's not going to be able to lower his price, uh, his oil for a dollar. He simply can't do it. Nobody buys his oil. He runs out of uh, capital. 
He goes out of business. John D. Rockefeller moves, moves in and takes us over that market. Now that there's no competition there, John D. Rockefeller can raise the uh, price of barrels of oil to $25, $30. People are not going to have any other option but to buy from him. He does this all throughout Ohio, and eventually he's going to start doing this in neighboring states as well. Um, he He's doing this because there's not any rules against it. There's not any rules against this because... Uh, this had never been an issue before. Transportation costs are going to start getting so cheap post-Civil War that you're able to do this and go into markets in other states um, uh, now uh, and, and be able to do this without a significant price increase. So John D. Rockefeller is doing this. His business grows out of Ohio, starts spreading throughout the United States, and he's doing it using these sort of devious methods but not illegal methods because nobody had seen this type of thing before him. And you're going to see other guys like Andrew Carnegie do it in steel, um, uh, J.P. Morgan, you'll, you'll, uh, you can read about him. Um, so he's doing this, other people are doing it as well. They're not doing anything illegal, they're just sort of getting out ahead of other people. And I shouldn't just say he's doing this sort of devious methods. He's also, you know, standardizing his products, he is finding ways to cut costs, and, you know, don't hate the player. Let me say, don't hate the player. Hate the game that he he's doing because the game is is kind of sneaky. Nobody he's not breaking any rules just yet. Uh, and also, you should point out that you know the guy's given to charity and things like that. So he's not he's not doing anything illegal, and he's not. I shouldn't say he's not morally maybe wrong, but legally he's not he's not doing anything wrong. Okay, so the answer would be to make it to where what he's doing is illegal because people, what happens here is that when he moves into an area, now people are getting price gouged. They're paying way more for a barrel of oil than they would if there was competition. So if you have the two people competing, the oil is going to be low and consumers are going to get um, uh, oil much cheaper. Um, another thing that's going to be a problem is when you drive out of business, basically the only game in town for workers, you can't choose who to work for. you got to work for John D. Rockefeller. Another sort of issue that comes along with this is Johnny Rockefeller, when you start getting bigger market shares, you become so important, you can sort of strong arm other companies that aren't even in your industry. As a matter of fact, when Johnny Rockefeller starts spreading out, he'll start, he becomes such a big uh, a part of the railroad industry that he starts going to railroad companies. Some of these companies, more than 50% of what they're shipping is John D. Rockefeller's oil. Well, John D. Rockefeller will say to them, I want you to ship my oil for no profit. And the railroad companies, well, that's ridiculous. We need to make money off your oil, um, you know, or else we're not going to be able to run. Nobody's going to make a profit for us. Well, John D. Rockefeller will say to these railroad companies, I'm 50% of your business. What's going to happen if I take away that business? Well, we're going to go out of business. We, we, we're just simply not going to have enough for, uh, product. What if I take it and give it to your competitors? Now your competitors are doing well. You're going to go out of business. Well, all right, I don't want my competitors doing well, so I'm going to ship your oil for little to no profit. So he starts strong-arming non-oil businesses. So he's not only putting out a business competition, but he's sort of manipulating other businesses also. Again, you know, no rules against this. Well, a lot of people are going to see this. I don't like paying extra for oil or steel or whatever, you know, uh, copper. So people see that these robber barons, these monopolists start doing this. Well, why don't politicians do something about this? I don't like to pay twenty, thirty dollars for a barrel of oil when it only costs John D. Rockefeller nine dollars or whatever to produce it. I want to pay, you know, what would happen or what the price would be if there were multiple people competing for for consumer dollars. Well, some people are going to call on politicians, do something about this. Well, here's the issue with that: you call on a Republican, hey. Come in here, regulate John D. Rockefeller, prevent him from putting people out of business. What are Republicans of the Gilded Age going to say to that? We kind of think that business needs to be big. John D. Rockefeller gets big. He becomes the world's leading oil supplier, which he is going to be uh, by the end of the 1800s. He can beat British oil suppliers, French oil suppliers. This is good. You know, sure, we don't necessarily like him putting out of people business. We don't like strong arming, but... Um, 
but again, we think bigger business the better. Uh, this is a depiction of, of a, a Standard Oil, sort of this monopoly, this uh, octopus is going to get so big. Well, Republican politicians aren't going to do anything because, in general, they see big business as better. Democrats, people say, we need to regulate this, we need to prevent these monopolies, we don't like to get price gouged. Democrats are going to say, it's not the government's responsibility to do anything. We're for small business. We don't think the government is responsible for regulating business. That's not its role. So the two parties you have to choose from, Republicans, they kind of like what's going on. Democrats, it's not a responsibility. You add on to that that John D. Rockefeller and other of these robber barons are going to start making so much money uh, because now they're the only game in town. As a matter of fact, John D. Rockefeller, I think of a number somewhere here, 90% of uh, refined oil, something like that, in the United States is going to be produced by Standard Oil, really only game in town. Um, uh, so it's going to get so big that John D. Rockefeller is going to have so much money. Let's say a politician does start talking about regulation. I think John D. Rockefeller's doing bad. I think we do need uh, to regulate the economy. How can John D. Rockefeller shut that guy up with money? Slip some money under the table. A lot of politicians are corrupt during this time. It's the Gilded Age. Maybe supply money to a guy running against him. Hey, um, this guy's, run, you know, he's talking about regulation. You run a campaign. We're going to make sure you have tons of people to send out your message. We're going to make sure you'll be able to send letters. We're gonna, you're going to put advertisements everywhere. You beat this guy. You take over his seat in the house. Um, hey, maybe that doesn't work. Maybe this guy's a great campaigner. Even with less money, he wins. Well, maybe we come up with a scandal or something. We blackmail this guy. We can get him out of office that way. So you'll see a lot of these guys get so much money that they can start manipulating politicians. And they can also start manipulating the public. So you get people with enough money, you can sort of do things to show the public, hey, I'm not a bad guy. A lot of these robber barons, and this maybe you give them a little bit of credit for this, they're going to start doing things like build, building museums. They're going to donate a lot of money to charity, like John D. Rockefeller donates over $500 million to charity. And this is in the late 1800s, or late 1800s, early 1900s, he donates to this. Uh, that's a ton of money. And a lot of people are going to say, I kind of like what this guy's doing. You, you always hear about the guys like Pablo Escobar who are able to you know, get the, the trust of people around him, even though they're taking advantage of the people around him, by buying them things. That's what John D. Rockefeller does to the general public. Buys newspapers. He's going to start buying newspapers. These newspapers are going to say, John D. Rockefeller's not a bad guy, or this Robert Barron's not a bad guy. Um, and they will start appealing directly to the public to try and uh, sort of uh, tamp down on the idea that they're price gouging and that they're putting out a business competition. Uh, by the way, John D. Rockefeller gets so wealthy that if you put the equivalent, uh, it, the amount of money he's worth at, at the, the peak of his wealth, if you convert that to today's dollars, he'd be worth over a trillion dollars. So the guy's extremely wealthy. He's good at, at manipulating the system. All right, so the, these robber barons, John D. Rockefeller in particular, but the other robber barons, this would be uh, John D. Rockefeller sort of poking in here at the White House, and you kind of see the Capitol building uh, where, where the Senate and the House of Representatives meet. It's basically a standard oil refinery. This shows sort of the pervasiveness of John D. Rockefeller in particular, but Robert Barron's in general. Um, so these guys can find ways to prevent this, this, uh, this uh, legislation from being put in place. Well, what about when uh, people get so fed up that this stuff doesn't work? So what you're going to start to see in the 1800s, particularly the 1880s, is a lot of state governments will decide, all right, John D. Rockefeller's got his hands in the federal government. He's driving out of business local governments. Let's say the state of North Carolina. Congress in, in North Carolina sees John D. Rockefeller as just driven out of business, oil refiners and, and neighboring, uh, let's say, uh, let's say Virginia, Tennessee, Kentucky, neighboring states, and they basically say they're going to be coming in here next unless we do something. They're going to be driving out paw oil in North Carolina. 
unless we do something to prevent this. So you'll see local governments, in particular state governments, start putting in place laws, and John D. Rockefeller is not going to be able to prevent all of these uh, state laws from being put into effect. And what these laws would say a lot of times is that if you own a business in this state, in a certain industry, you can't own a majority of stock in another business, a similar business in another state. So basically, if you own an oil company in North Carolina, and the way a lot of these states work is that if you do business, you've got to register as a corporation in the, con in the uh, uh, state. So if you operate in North Carolina, you've got to uh, register your business, you know, op own s open Standard Oil North Carolina. But if you do that, you can't also open Standard or continue to own Standard Oil Ohio because that would be against North Carolina law. We're saying that if you own a majority stake in an oil company, you can't also own a majority stake in a different state. So you'll see this sort of local reaction to this. So this is going to be pushing back against that. So John D. Rockefeller is going to have to deal with this. You'll also see eventually in 1887, uh, enough public pressure will get the United States government to pass something called the Interstate Commerce Commission. And what this is, is going to use this tiny clause of the Constitution called the Interstate Commerce Clause. All this is, this was originally put in by the Founding Fathers because states had passed duties against one another and would charge import-export duties when you went from one state to another. They didn't want that to happen. So basically they said the federal government controls interstate trade. So if anything crosses interstate lines uh, for business, well, they use that clause to create this Interstate Commerce Commission. And this says if you do business across an, an interstate border, the, basically the federal government can investigate charges against you. So John D. Rockefeller is now faced with this issue where states are starting to react to his expansion. And I shouldn't say just John D. Rockefeller. Remember, it's different robber barons and in different industries are also going to face the same issue. But now you have to face this where you cross state borders, potentially the federal government could get involved, and state, if you go into new states, you basically have to follow these state laws that say things like you can't own majority stock in another state. So how to get around this? Well, what John D. Rockefeller and a number of these other robber barons are going to come up with is the idea of a trust, okay? So a trust is going to be different businesses in name, so multiple businesses in name that are in reality operated under a single person or a single business. So what John D. Rockefeller will do, and you can see this right here, this is a, a, a cartoon of these various trusts basically looking over Congress and basically making sure that their, their interests are represented. But what John D. Rockefeller will do is he's going to start different companies. And Standard Oil will basically run under companies like Exxon, Mobil, these all, uh, Amico, I believe that's right, Mobil, they all used to be part of uh, Standard Oil, but what would happen is to get around these interstate trade uh, laws and these state restrictions, they would say, all right, fine, I, John D. Rockefeller, do not own this oil refining company in North Carolina. That's not me. It's my friend Bill Bilson runs it, okay? Same thing over here in Massachusetts. My friend Steve Stevenson owns it. We're independent companies. So Steve Stevenson runs Steve Oil. Bill Bilson runs Bill Oil. I run Standard Oil in Ohio. But in reality, Bill Bilson, Steve Stevenson, they're going to be meeting with John D. Rockefeller, and they're going to be working together. You know, John D. Rockefeller will distribute money to them if necessary to drive out of business competition. So in name, they are in different companies. And hypothetically, Bill Bilson could go off and, you know, do something because the company's going to be in his name and go against the Standard Oil Trust. But in reality, he's not going to do that because he knows the other guys will come in and put out his business if he does that. So they're in name different companies, but they're basically operating under the uh, a single company. So John D. Rockefeller will basically own minority stakes in these various companies. So Steve Stevenson Oil in Massachusetts, John Johnson Oil in Florida. But in reality, they're all taking orders from him. And it didn't necessarily happen this way, although it did sometimes. Think about all these companies periodically meeting around a, a, a boarding table and saying, hey, we have an upstart oil company um, here. 
all right, let's invest some money in your company. Let's drive them out of business. We all profit, all right? And again, you'll see here we've got other ones, Sugar Trust, uh, Coal Trust, um, Copper Trust, Steel Trust, Nail Trust. It's not just John D. Rockefeller. Again, we're just using him as a stand-in. So they developed these trusts, okay? Well, how are you going to deal with this? Locally, you can't do anything about it because they're not violating the state laws. And technically, they're not crossing interstate borders because they're all operating within their state. What do we do here? How can you, uh, how can you get around this? Well, in 1890, there's going to be something passed called the Sherman Antitrust Act. The public is going to put enough pressure to deal with these trusts, everybody knows what's starting to happen in, in the creation of these trusts, put on Congress to pass a legislation called the Sherman Antitrust Act with the idea being that if the federal government, um, if they learn that they there's companies operating in concert across interstate lines and operating in the interest of a trust to put out of business competition, so basically if they recognize and they can prove that people are acting in concert to suppress competition across interstate lines, the federal government can step in for stock sell-offs and regulate to basically or basically make sure the companies split apart and act in competition. So again, this is sort of a, a very quick summary, but if the federal government basically finds out if a company is determined that people are operating companies in the interest of single individual or single company and are working in concert to suppress comp suppress competition, the government finds this out, it can force the companies to break apart, compete with one another. So, hey, it sounds like this would be a solution. The problem with the Sherman Tra Antitrust Act is you have to prove that. Well, here's the thing. When this is passed, there's no body created to investigate these trusts. So there's nobody that's going to go out and follow, you know, John D. Rockefeller, follow Bill Bilson around and determine these guys are going to these meetings, take a picture of the meetings, check the books. And so in order to prove something like that, man, that's going to be tough. You've got to get books. You've got to get maybe witnesses. You've got to find a lot of paperwork. But there's no uh, there's nobody to do this. So. Sherman Antitrust Act, it's going to be toothless. And a lot of these guys, because they're in the pocketbook of these uh, trusts, they're not even going to be interested in, uh, interested in actually enforcing the Sherman Antitrust Act. So what all this means is that through going into the 1890s, even though people are starting to pay attention to what these monopolistic practices, they're going to continue on.